Bob Chapek, thanks for being here. It's great to have you. We appreciate it. A busy week. Appreciate you taking time to come down to Laguna. Thanks for having me. Beautiful setting. Uh, obviously, the first question, the thing everybody wants to know, I think you've got the world premiere of Wakanda Forever tonight. So yes. tell us the plot of the movie and everything that happens, please. I think that's what everybody wants. Uh, well, I, th I think that would uh, probably get me excommunicated. <laughs> uh, but let's just say this. Uh, we're very proud of that film. And... Uh, I think it's going to be a real crowd pleaser. Yeah. Do you enjoy those premieres? That's one of the fun perks of this job, I would think. And well, you know, I've been with Disney 30 years now, and uh, I started off my first 19 years at the movie studio, and as such, I've been to quite a few premieres. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency as they kind of come one after another after another to think of, oh, gosh, it's another premiere. Yeah. But each one is really sort of the gestation of a bunch of, creative people's really hard work yeah. for about five years. Yeah. And uh, when you think of it in that context, it's like, wow, this is a really special moment. And it's nice to see those things finally kind of come to life. And, and of course, this one, because of uh, uh, Chadwick Boseman, an un unusually uh, a poignant and meaningful one. I yes, I, I'm sure there will be a, a lot of emotion yeah. uh, tonight. Uh, well, that sounds uh, exciting. I know people are looking forward to that one. Um, Obviously, I have a lot to ask you about Disney, but I want to start really with kind of a satellite question, and then we'll get into some specifics. So, as Jason mentioned, uh, you've been in the job about two and a half years. You came in really like a week or two before the pandemic hit, so uh, uh, quite a time to take over. Uh, you've been pretty willing from the start to uh, aggressively rethink strategy, approach. I think you wanted to tackle some sacred cows. Uh, that's obviously also generated some headlines that we can talk about in different ways, but you're, you've had your contract extended for three years uh, this year. And so I really want to ask in the broadest sense possible, you just mentioned you've been at Disney a long time, what's your overall sense as you change Disney as it evolves of w whenever you hand the keys over, how's the world changing? What does Disney need to be? What, what, do you move, what are you evolving to meet in the world right, that you see? Right, right. Well, you know, our legacy is really important. Uh, we're a company that turns 100 years old next year. And uh, there's very few companies like the two of ours <laughs> that can say that they've been around for 100 years or more. In fact, the statistic that I understand is that less than one one hundredth of a percent of companies can say they've been around 100 years or more. So that you're sort of in rarefied air uh, to be one of those companies. But for us, there's a lot of things that will be the same. Storytelling, for example. Yeah. The root and the heart of the Walt Disney Company is in storytelling. That will not change. But there are other things that we'll need to transform and we'll need to evolve. Another strength we have that won't change is our brands and franchises. Our brands and franchises really are the, the pillars that keep our company going. Uh, but technology is evolving, and much like, at least from a strategy standpoint, you know, Walt really set the world on fire with, you know, uh, the multiplane camera and a lot of technology to help tell stories. We need to do that as well, and sometimes that means that you've got to sort of be bold mm -hmm. and use new technologies for storytelling and give your creative people another dimension uh, to paint, yeah. if you will, and we want to go ahead and do that. But ultimately, really what we're after is to create those magical memories that last a lifetime. Let's get into some of the specifics on that then. I think, I think one of your biggest projects right now is, uh, is, is, is beefing up the Disney Plus app. Making I've heard the term uh, lifestyle brand app thrown around compared to just a streaming app. What does that mean? What do you want it to be? Well... You know, once upon a time, you talked about <laughs> some of the transformation I've done since I've gotten the job. I think we had more or less five operating units in the company, yeah. and I distilled it down into two. The physical world of our parks and our cruises and things like that, and then the digital or media world that we operate in. And that's a direct reflection of a couple things, but maybe most fundamentally, it's a reflection that if you're a fan of Disney, you really don't care about our organizational structure. And the less silos that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, the less silos that we have, the less times that we have to worry about going cross transom in order yeah. to, 
you know, make something happen. If you look at the, our company through the eyes, look at our brands, our franchises, our stories, through the eyes of a consumer, all they see is what I call capital D. They only see Disney, and we should facilitate that. So a lifestyle brand is, you know, if you look at what we're doing with Story Living by Disney, our 55-plus communities, it's really about embracing that lifestyle, not relying on the consumer only to piece it together themselves, but really creating that, that, that sort of that lifestyle brand that Disney is, we just don't facilitate it. So, so if, I, if you've got the parks and the cruises and the content, does it mean you know, bringing commerce? We've talked a lot about commerce at this conference, or commerce into it in a way more than you've got, or, or other kinds of features and things that you'd like over time to see that grow and expand into? It's commerce, but I think the commerce is an outcome of the inputs, and the inputs are really a holistic relationship with the company, so no, no matter what phase of life you're in, you're still building those magical memories, either for your grandkids, or for you, or your friends and family. And so bringing together the physicality of Disney plus the media element of Disney into one element, I think is really what, it, it's our job. So one of the things, you, you talked about how the world has changed even while Disney stays the same. When, when I hear that, I think, you know, competitively, you're thinking about an Amazon or maybe about uh, some Chinese apps. Is it, is it something like Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime kind of thing, uh, product in a way as you think about it? No, it's really, not really. It's, a, it's about customizing and personalizing our products and experiences to cater to what individuals want as opposed to sort of looking at them in mass and trying to program that way. Mm -hmm. And I think when we do that, and we have unique ability to do that, not only because we have the physical and the digital or, and the media, but because people have such a deep founded relationship with Disney. Yeah. I mean, th they love this company. A and, and, they, and frankly, they don't even look at it as a company. They look at it as a, 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 a utility. They look at it as something that's part of their lives. Yeah, part that, of their identity, really. Yeah, part of their ways, identity. Yeah. And, you know, that's great. We need to embrace that. But it also puts extra pressure on us because they don't think of us as a company. And when we do things that normal companies might do, yeah. you know, sometimes it, it creates a friction because all of a sudden they're like, well, well, well why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah. But, of course, we have shareholders that have different expectations. So... One of the pleasures of my job is trying to balance <laughs> yeah. all the different constituencies, and uh, especially with a brand like Disney. Well, I, I, and I want to come back to some of those points of friction, but you know, I, I, it's an interesting thing that you're saying because as streaming services uh, have taken off, and we've all got got a lot of them. Part of what you describe, I think, is it's fair to say, is a way to make sure Disney isn't affected by churn and streaming. But Disney Plus is more than just streaming. Uh, but the landscape has changed very fast in the last couple of years, so. How many streaming services between Netflix and Disney Plus and HBO Max and Paramount, how, how many can the consumer ultimately want or pay for in your view as this, as this industry develops? Yeah, I don't know that there's an easy answer to how many, but I'll say first, I think we'll be one of them mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day. And I think that not everybody who's out in the marketplace today will make it ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, unless there's some type of recombination of, you know, secondary players in the marketplace that combine to create something greater. This is a critical mass business. Mm -hmm. Streaming is a critical mass business. Um, scale is really, really important in order to be able to thrive. And uh, so I think there'll be fewer than more, but definitely we'll, we'll be there. And I think you, you, you kind of said earlier, more than content streaming, other feature services, other things are really going to become necessary to, to make it in this world. Absolutely. Part of the lifestyle brand is using Disney Plus, not as a movie server service, but using it as a platform for experiential Disney uh, uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, we have ambition to use Disney Plus way beyond just a movie service. You mentioned a minute ago, and I just want to take you back quickly to your uh, restructuring of the company. I think it's fair to say Disney uh, has been famous for a long time for having large, very powerful fiefdoms as a company. 
uh, a mixed history uh, in different ways with technology. C can you just talk a little bit more about um, how you're thinking about the change in the company and how it will continue to evolve and, and how much patience it, it's going to require to get it where you think it needs to be uh, structurally? I right. mean, the, the part of it is the digital is so demanding in a sort of centrality of many kinds of things in a way that wasn't always the case. Right. So you've got a centrality issue and you still want local local work by artists. So, so uh, how far do you have to go still and where you want the company to be? Well, I think if we follow the consumer, we're going to be in pretty good shape. There are certain things that the consumer, our guest, our audience loves about Disney and those things are immutable and will never change. Call it the magic. Hmm. Call it wonder. Call it fantasy. Call it optimism. Those things can never change. But I think the challenge with becoming a company that's going to turn to its next century is not being so beholden to legacy that you're afraid to evolve because we all know what happens when you're afraid to evolve. And so, it's again, it's another balancing factor between being respectful of the legacy, understanding what got us here, but then knowing that the world is changing so fast now and that we've got to change with it. I always say I'd like to be on the front end of the wave, not on the back end of the wave, uh, and you know, create those opportunities, create those transformative moments for the company and be bold, and technology is certainly a way to do that. But I think what, what, in the end of the day, if we follow the consumer, we're going to be great. And to go to your question about local markets versus, you know, obviously mm -hmm. Star Wars and Marvel and Pixar and Disney, those are big across the world. But in a lot of markets, that is not the predominance of media consumption. Mm -hmm. And so we've just built another thing that we did that was transformative, at least for the Walt Disney Company. We built centers of creative excellence around the globe so that if there's particular content that needs to be built in India that caters to the Indian uh, audience, we've got that now. And, uh, How many people have you got around the globe in those centers, roughly? Do you know? That's a, that's a big deal. Well, we have roughly 200,000 cast members, as yeah. we call them, yeah. around the globe, uh, a good chunk of them uh, catering to local market needs. So yeah. I, I like to use the term strategically consistent and tactically divergent because we need to be strategically consistent across the globe because we are Disney and our brands and our franchises are everything, but at the same time, one size does not fit all. So, for instance, in India, they're making Indian market content and for, 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 for Disney there. We might not see that here ever. You would likely not see it here, uh, although one of our goals is to have our content travel so that we can build something, say, in Latin America or Europe or in Asia and have it be something that is just pure great content and can travel. But we realize the majority of it's probably going to stay within the market that it was created in. So that, that sort of touches on a larger thing that I know has been an issue for you uh, in the job. You, you've talked a lot about, uh, you were just talking about scale a few minutes ago. I think you like to talk about feeding the beast, the demanding content to keep a streaming service alive. Uh, it's widely thought, you know, and I think you've spoken at different times, that, that uh, Disney could have a deeper content library over time, would like to have one. If your critics say you're very dependent on the franchises and the extensions, how deep does your content pool need to get, do you think, from where it is now? Well, when you have a streaming service that has the risk of churn, you need to constantly refresh your services with new content. So then it becomes a question of rate. What is the rate of replenishment that you need in order not to churn people out? And obviously, we had COVID, like every other company had, and essentially, we stopped creating new things for way too long. Things were in development because it didn't take production, so you can do development from your homes. But then, finally, the dam broke, and now all that content is rushing out. Mm -hmm. And so it gives us the opportunity now to feed each of our distribution entities, whether it's theatrical, whether it's linear television, and streaming without having to do what we did in the very beginning, which was select and choose. Oh, one piece of content's coming out because it was close to post-production when COVID has, where's it going to go? Now we can actually very thoughtfully plan the amount of content we need to maximize each channel without being inefficient by overproducing. And so you can imagine nothing, nothing, nothing 
the dam breaks, everything comes, and we're now just normalizing this. And I think we've said in the past that the fourth quarter of this year is where we'll finally reach some level of normalization and, and going forward, uh, you know, do things on a very rational standpoint in terms of new content for each channel. I know you're in a quiet period, so this is not meant to be a leading question specifically related to that, but as you deepen your pool, is it, I mean, you have, as you just said, been, been, been creating a lot more and thinking about that. Will it be all self-generated? Might you be in the market possibly for content libraries if they become available one day or other, or, or, or other ways of, of, of deepening the pool? How do you think about that in the space? We have the best creative teams in the best, best brands and franchises in the world. And uh, we're, we're quite happy with our ability to have an output level uh, with the kind of quality that we expect across all our distribution channels in all our countries without having to be a buyer in the open marketplace. So our, our plan is to have all of our content creation self-contained. Okay, uh, interesting. Now you have an interesting uh, piece of it, which is the Hulu piece. Um, and so, you know, Disney uh, got some attention with something like Pam and Tommy uh, last year on Hulu. Um, how do you think, as you extend the content and the kinds of content that fit with the Disney brand or don't, how do you think about that line of appropriateness? I mean, I, I kind of assume, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong, I kind of assume Dahmer wouldn't be on uh, <laughs> Disney <laughs> or Squid Games. But, uh, you know, Pam and Tommy did raise a few eyebrows. So, so how do you think about, you know, what's the line for Disney in a changing world? I'll withhold judgment on any one title, but what I will tell you is every day, even after 30 years, I am amazed at the elasticity of the Disney brand. Mm. Uh, I always say that when our fans and our audiences put their kids to bed at night after watching Pinocchio or Dumbo or Little Mermaid, they're probably not going to tune into another animated movie. Mm -hmm. they, they want something for them. And I, again, I want to respect legacy. I want to respect what this brand is. But at the same time, I know that we may be even more precious about what's Disney than the consumer base is. And if, it's, if the consumer base has more elasticity than we've traditionally had in terms of defining what's Disney, then we probably ought to listen to our audience, which means we have more degrees of freedom than we probably thought. Well, it's interesting you, you, you say it. It's interesting that you mentioned Pinocchio, though, because obviously one of the things we see in our, you know, volatile in some ways divided world is, is, is Disney often becomes a political footfall, partly because people feel so passionately about Disney. And this. So I know you want to reflect changes, reach all families, all kinds of families, be contemporary, but you also get blowback. I mean, Lightyear uh, was banned in the Middle East because of a same-sex kiss. You mentioned Pinocchio. I, I may be wrong, but I think the new Pinocchio, uh, he doesn't change in the end. He just accepts himself for who he is. So the ending has changed a little bit with sort of contemporary mores. And, you know, you're, 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 people love to get out there and say Disney's too woke. Disney's become too correct, politically correct. You know, are they right? Do they have a point? What's your take on that, those criticisms and reaching that wide span of people? You know, I think the more complex something is, the more you have to really drill down into the basics. And we want our content to reflect the rich, diverse world that we live in. And again, I guess that's another way of saying catering to your, to your audience. But the world is a rich, diverse place, and we want our content to reflect that. And we're so blessed to have the greatest content creators, and they see it similarly. But I think that's good from a commercial standpoint as well, because then you appeal to the largest possible audience. And certainly, you know, we live in a world now where everything seems to, you know, be polarized. Mm. But uh, I think we want Disney to stand for bringing people together. I always say when someone walks down Main Street and you look at the castle, you're not thinking, you know, I'm on one side of the political spectrum or the other. You have a shared belief in all the wonderful aspects of what Disney is, mm -hmm. and we want to use Disney to bring people together, and I think we'll do that by 
diverse stories and diverse characters. What, what do you think your, your role as CEO of this gigantic company is very specifically on that storytelling front, though? I mean, you, 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 again, I don't, you, you've got to, when you read, oh, light year is banned in this region because of this kiss or something like that, I'm sure it comes to you after the, 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 the product has been pretty far down the path. Do you have a role in some ways of shepherding, shaping? Do you have views about what you should be doing there? Do you think that you leave it to the creators and, and, and do you get to express your opinions? Yeah, we talk about shaping our content a lot and some of the push-pull of all these different forces. But in the end, we have to follow our North Star, which again is storytelling and catering to the audiences that are that actually love Disney mm. and all audiences that love Disney. So, to be clear, you don't think Disney's too woke? Uh, I think Disney is a company that has survived for 100 years by catering to its audience and it's going to thrive the next 100 years by catering to its audience. Part of the audience is uh, sports fans. I think you affirmed fairly recently um, uh, ESPN remains important to Disney. You just signed a contract with F1, which I think has been very good to Disney. Yep. There's a lot happening in the space around live sports. Amazon has been chasing uh, as a pro football. Are you where you want to be on live sports? Are you feeling like others in the space, there's more to get and, uh, and, uh, and put on air? And how are you thinking about it? We love live sports because it's, live sports and news are one of the few businesses where there's a timeliness to the viewing now. And if you're in an ad business, that is extremely important as advertisers try to generate an audience during a specific time. We happen to be uh, very present and very proud of our work in both of those areas. I think for those folks that look at ESPN and you know, are f sort of talking about, well, is it really right at Disney? Is it not right at Disney? I think what they're failing to see is that ESPN is a power brand. It represents, like Disney does in terms of its family audiences, to the sports fan, it is the power brand out there. And that power brand, while certainly it plays a lot in the world of linear television, we talk about, well, you know, what's happening to, you know, the cable bundle and our people cord cutting, that is a particular execution of that brand that happens to have been very powerful and relevant for many years, mm -hmm. still is in many ways, but that is not the essence of the brand. The brand is much larger than that, and the brand will continue to evolve in terms of how it reaches its consumer, but it's still a really great brand, and that's what we look at when we look at the long-term prognosis for an asset within the company or a brand or a franchise within the company. It's a great brand, and I know for a fact there are dozens of companies that would love to have that asset mm -hmm. if they could. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? Well, you know, uh, there has been a lot written <laughs> in the press about, you know, ESPN's not a great fit for Disney, Disney's not a great fit for ESPN. And while we discounted it, a lot of people consume that and uh, our phone started ringing. Yeah. So we must have something great with ESPN because everybody seems to want it. Is, is the brand flexible enough to bring sports betting into it as uh, sports betting becomes more common and popular around? Uh... Well, once again, that will be up to the consumers, and the consumers, particularly the younger, under 35 consumers, are telling us that they want a robust, lean-forward sports experience, not maybe you know their grandfather's lean-back type sports experience. And so we're looking at all different options in terms of how we can deliver on that guest and consumer expectation of a lean-forward sports experience. Okay, uh, we've got to hit on a couple of other areas in the time we've got left, and uh, we could talk a long time. So, I, I, I again, thank you for being here. Uh, you came up and uh, uh, know the parks very well. We and others have been writing about the pricing strategies you've taken. Uh, you've candidly said it's partly about managing supply and demand because the demand is so high. With, with high demand for the parks, you know, does that suggest there's room to grow the parks, open more parks, that the parks business will continue to change? And again, taking a long view, uh, where does parks need to go for, uh, for you? Well, our parks were very successful before the pandemic. As you know, we shut them down depending on what park and what part of the world for a year to two years. And we opened them up and, you know, uh, we were very pleased with co consumers' willingness to come back. I think a lot of that 
had to do with trust that they had in our brand that we would open them up in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. And we certainly, you know, through things like the MBA bubble, uh, I think that was a model for how you can actually operate uh, a business where people had to come together. And I think that brought us, brought us a, lot of, uh, uh, a, a lot of confidence in people's mind. Uh, since then, uh, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, a strong business for us. And I think that as long as we continue to have those stories and tell those stories in a way that meet our guest needs, that will continue then to encourage people to come to our, our parks and go on our cruises and uh, continue to be a robust business going forward. Do you worry, I mean, y y you mentioned the, the, the passionate Disney fan base. It is passionate. They go online, they have forums, mm -hmm. they debate your they pricing. They do. Some love it, some hate it. What's the line on continuing to manage it as you have but not alienating those customers, those diehards? We want to guarantee a great guest experience no matter when people come. If they come the second Tuesday in September, we want them to have a great guest experience. Maybe that wouldn't be so hard in the past, but if they come the day after Thanksgiving, we also want to guarantee that they're going to have a great experience. Mm. The people who actually come into the park that day, we want them to have a great experience so that no matter what day you come, you are guaranteed to get that magical experience that creates magical memories that last a lifetime. In a world where we don't control demand, you're left with one of two situations. You either let way too many people into the park where they don't have a great experience, or you manage it by just turning people away at the gate. Now imagine if you're a family from Seattle and you come to Disneyland, you come for a two or three day stay, you're there at 10 o'clock in the morning and you're turned away because we won't let too many people in the park. So what we developed during the uh, COVID shutdown is a reservation system so we can plan like every other business out there, like an airline that's got fixed capacity, like an airline, hotel, cruise industry, we developed a reservation system so people would know ahead of time whether they were going to get in or not. And then we practiced yield management, which again, which every other company in the world can do, uh, so that we, you know, have pricing be a reflection of how many people we can actually let in and still guarantee that great experience. So for some of our fans, that's heresy, you know, but I think it's, it's not only good business practice in terms of maximizing shareholder value, but more importantly, it protects the guest experience so that when you get into the park, you can have confidence it's not going to be overcrowded. We've talked at this conference quite a bit. It won't surprise you about the metaverse. I, I, that's not a term you like very much, right? So, but Yeah, we tend not to use that word uh, because for us, that's a big, broad term. Well, but for us, it's next generation storytelling. Well, so right. I, so the parks, I mean, when you think about the metaverse and all the things it means, the parks, you could imagine pretty quickly that being a place where the metaverse, whatever you call it, could really enhance mm -hmm. the, the experiences that you're doing, the kinds of things you're offering. So you and I have talked a little bit about this. How will the metaverse change the Mickeyverse? Well, it's, for us, it's the physical and digital aspects of your Disney lifestyle coming together so that if you're on Disney+, Plus, we should be aware, assuming you give us the permission to have that, awareness. We should be aware of what happened, what you experienced, what you liked the last time you visited a park, and vice versa. When you're in a park, we should know what your viewing habits are on Disney+. Plus. Again, assuming that you give us the permission and the ability to use that data in that way. But once that happens, we've now brought your entire Disney existence into a place where we can give you a better experience in the park because we know what your preferences are in terms of viewing and a better experience on Disney Plus because we know what your affinities are and what your behavior is. More tailored, are. more, I guess, customized and personalized. And things like that. Yes. yes, customized and personalized for you. And how Not far for are you? People uh, that look like you, for you. How far down that road are you really now? Is that a vision more than a. Than, than, uh, well, we're putting the arms and legs on it right now inside our own. Uh, uh, technical groups. What we're trying to do is build a toolbox of utilities 
that then can be used by our creators at Pixar, at Disney, at Marvel, at Lucas, that can then take those utilities and use them to tell stories in a different, more customized, more personalized way, given your affinities. Can you give me, I mean, it's hypothetical, a little, maybe can you give me an example of what you mean? Like if I'm a Pirates of the Caribbean viewer or writer, it extends, and, you know, like what, what would actually happen? How would you extend it around theoretically? Okay, so if let's let's start. Say you were a Pirates of the Caribbean writer. Yeah. Okay. When you go home, we know that you wrote Pirates of the Caribbean. So maybe the first thing that get that pops up isn't other things that you've looked at in the past or people that look like you have seen in the past, but what you get is special programming tailored to Pirates of the Caribbean that would be unique to people like you that is personalized towards your preferences. So, because right now, right, if you're on streaming service, what you get is, well, you've watched things that sort of look like this, or people that are kind of like in your same demographic, what people would watch next. And oftentimes they're a complete record scratch because it doesn't, it, it's nothing like what you watch. Yeah. Well, if people love pirates, then there's demand for more pirates. Yeah. So let's give them something specific to pirates. And it sounds like your vision includes ultimately even ways to potentially customize some content for me and have there be a feedback loop that takes it further, exactly. as far deep as I want to go. Exactly. I want to end on a couple of uh, other notes. You know, we're a few months out from the controversy in Florida. I don't think we need to relitigate all the details, but Given a little time and distance, when you look back on uh, what happened with the, the governor and uh, 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 and the, the tax uh, uh, benefits for Disney, you know, what do you think you did right, and, and, and what do you think you did wrong? What are the lessons you've drawn from that? I think the lesson is the lesson that we probably always knew, which is that Disney, it's all about the cast. If you think about the nature of why people have great Disney memories, remember the end benefit is memories, magical memories that last a lifetime. The reason they have those, yeah, it's about the castle, and yeah, it's about the great attractions, or they really enjoyed that churro on Main Street, but really what they remember more than anything is gas, guest cast interactions. Mm. And so if that's the secret sauce for making those magical memories, when I ran parks for, gosh, I don't know what it was, like seven years, almost, I would say 99% of the letters I got were about guest cast interactions, not about attractions. Literally, it was almost every single one. So if that's the key to a great guest experience, and we're all about the guest and the audience and maximizing their experience, then you have to make sure that the cast is at the center of everything that you do. So, so uh, reading between the lines, you misjudged how the employees would react with your initial out of the gate, and you had to get that right because you need because that was a challenge for you. The, the reaction to your original stance of not speaking out on on, don't, on the, the bill is that. Well, what I would say is that we were reminded through our, the passion of our cast reaction yeah. and how important their sentiments are on these issues in terms of making them feel that they were part of the Walt Disney Company and could relate to the products that the Walt Disney Company puts out. I mean, it's a tricky situation, isn't it? I mean, every CEO is grappling with it. I'm sure you get calls for advice because it's a political world, so uh, Disney probably more than most. You get pressures from liberal politicians, conservative politicians, workforces are more active and vocal. I mean, it seemed like your original aim was to address that by in saying we're not going to get political, and you got, whether you wanted to or not, you got pulled into it. So I in a way, it's an object lesson of the challenge at this time, So, uh, for, and, and not just for you, but for all CEOs. So, yeah. so people call you and they say, you know, give me advice, Bob. What do, you, what do you tell them? Stick to your values, stick to your North Star, simplify the cacophony of voices out there, and do what you think is right. You know, one thing that was, uh, occurred to me as I was, was, was getting ready for this, too, is, you know, part of this, particularly in Florida, people were very personal with you. Uh, it got very personal for some people. It is very personal. It's a reminder of the, of, uh, the importance, as you said, of Disney in people's lives. 
when you got this job, did you were you ready for that? Well, like, like is the intensity of personal feelings people bring to the CEO of Disney what you expected? Is this is it a surprise? Well, I ran parks for seven years, and you know I was quite familiar with how passionate people can be. I mean, if we move a churro cart ten feet, it's a big deal. Yeah. If we change, you know, an attraction, you know, from Tower of Terror to Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> you know, wow, the lines went from 30 minutes long to six hours long. Yeah, but, long. They, but they would come after your yeah. predecessor in many cases for that, not for you personally when, they, when fans were upset, right? I mean, you're the guy on the hot seat now. Is it, is it hard? Well, certainly, you know, y y we all want to make everybody happy all the time. I'm not sure that's possible in this world. So again, we have to sort of distill this down and say, who do we want to be? Who do we want the company to be? And by the way, who I, I my own personal feelings aren't really important. Yeah. What's important is how people think about our company. And so I take myself out of it. And I think that's, that's sort of the surprises. Everybody sort of wants to be loved and everybody wants everyone to like them. And, but in this, in this world, that's not always necessary. So I wash all that away. I say, what do we want the capital D Disney company to stand for? And if we're doing right by the capital D Disney company and can, can sort of sleep at night, then, you know, I can, I can be Teflon and know that we're doing the right thing. But I do have to finish by saying you did grow this beard not too long ago. <laughs> uh, was, that, was that your idea? Was that the comm staff idea to soften no, you up? No, this was my wife's idea. <laughs> Every time I escape for a week and go have some fun, uh, I typically don't shave. And every time I come home, my wife's like, don't shave it. Don't shave it. Oh, well. So my wife, being the boss of the household, uh, supported by my daughters who also wanted me not to shave it, it became a thing. So well, it's still here. So that's the most important customer on a good note. To most end important on, so. thing is my wife. Right? Okay. Bob, JPEG, thank you very much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.